So welcome to the third presentation in this course, Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World. This session, we're talking about resistance in the post-colonial world, resistance as the principal conceptual reaction to imperialism and the struggle for self-determination. So I'm going to go over the topic on, on these three headings, resistance and self-determination, current challenges for self-determination, different forms of resistance and the media wars. And I've outlined in the, um, in the notes which are online, so you don't have to write things down. You can download and, if you like, print out copies of these slides, which I'm going to put on screen, and also the set question for this week. So first of all, let's recap the last session, which was about imperial history and self-determination. Imperial history, the history of the domination of nations by powerful nations embodied the worst of all antisocial evils, colonization, genocide and large scale slavery. And it was the reaction to that history across many cultures, across many centuries that drove resistance and the demand for recognition of the principle of self-determination, which was finally widely recognized in the late 20th century. That right of a people to self-determination was pioneered mainly by the former colonies and only grudgingly accepted by the former colonial powers. I outlined some of the history of that in the last session. That happens to coincide with the period of US dominance in this post-colonial era. And the US era is somewhat different to the era of the European empires because of the nature of doublespeak and the fact that historically, the United States of America did not consider itself to be an imperial power or a power with colonies, despite the fact that it purchased entire nations and conquered territories and so on. As a result, many of the new forms of domination in the current era, whether through aid relations or development cooperation or humanitarian intervention or the so-called global war on terrorism, they are the sorts of forms of domination that characterize this era and pose many of the new challenges for resistance. So looking at this, uh, the theme for this session, resistance, what is it and why? And I want to spend some time looking at the different uh, cultural approaches to similar generic themes. The origins of a right to people to self-determination was recognized after many centuries of struggle against colonization intervention. And resistance, I suggest, properly understood, comprises all the efforts to assert this self-determination in the face of invasions, colonization, enslavement, proxy wars, domination, all forms of intervention. So in this post-colonial era, we're formally speaking the colonial era is illegitimate. There are common threats, but a variety of forms of resistance, uh, a variety of unique cultures that uh, engage in this sort of resistance, traditional resistance, new forms of resistance, and across many cultures and in the various um, themes of ideological, existential, developmental, military resistance. Syria's Grand Mufti, Dr. Ahmed Badruddin Hassoun said uh, recently that resistance should not be based on any religion. I think the context of that is that in the Middle East, we see something that's called generically the resistance, which is associated and famously led by the Shia party Hezbollah in Lebanon. But from the Syrian point of view, the historic pluralism in Syria draws attention to the need to see resistance in broader and more inclusive terms. That's why I'm going to spend a little time in this presentation in talking about resistance in Latin America and in the Melanesian countries too, in defense of customary land, for example. So provisionally, what is resistance? This is the beginning uh, set of key elements, I'd suggest. Resistance is action aimed at realizing the right of a people to self-determination. It exists in various cultures and has common imperial, colonial and neo-colonial enemies. It requires strong social structures to defend and reproduce independent cultures. Any weak resistance culture is going to be walked over very quickly. Resistance cultures have unique values and histories but they also share some common features. They're typically some sort of solidarity society with very strong social values, such as mutual respect and extensive sharing and institutions for that sort of sharing. Let's look at a couple of contrasts to start with. Here's a quote from Fidel Castro talking about 
what he began to speak of as the battle of ideas. Our battle of ideas will not cease as long as the current imperialist, hegemonic and unipolar system is still in place and remains a scourge of humanity and a mortal threat to the survival of our species. Now, before we look at a video of Fidel dealing with resistance in another Latin American country, let's look at the words of Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of the Lebanese resistance, speaking a few years ago when he spoke about confronting foreign colonialism. This resistance is an original expression, an original extension of the history and of these generations. Resistance is the culture of direct jihadi military action or remaining steadfast, the steadfastness of the owners of the land in their land. The resistance is not a definite organization, party, movement, trend, group or sect. It is a culture which can embrace diversified entities which can be doctrinally and ideologically contradicting. But the bases of the resistance are innate in humans and the goals are a common interest. So here we have a religious leader, in other words, drawing on religious inspiration, but using a language which is rather more universal. Let's turn to the video where Fidel speaks to a, a, an audience in Chile in 1971, another Latin American country, but one with a quite different history and at a time when the popular unity government led by Salvador Allende had come to power. Fidel was speaking to a Latin American audience with some shared history and some very different history. But his own uh, synthesis of ideas comes from the great Cuban nationalist Jose Marti, uh, a humanist, a man who was influenced by radical liberals, who had some ideas that would be considered socialist today, a mixture, not a, not a well-formulated economic program, but some important principles which, which remained central to the Cuban revolution led by Fidel. In his own words, Fidel Castro said that his contribution consisted of having brought about a synthesis of the ideas of Marti and of Marxist-Leninism and having applied them consistently to our struggle. And he is one of the characters unique in the world in the 20th century who, for example, not only led a revolution to overthrow an existing regime, uh, domination by the US, very close to the US itself, but also constructed a new state, a new system which survived and has thrived and has become quite a remarkable system in world terms. The key ideas involved here are a type of socialist humanism, a very powerful internationalism, a rejection of foreign imperial domination, a firm commitment to the idea, which was also expressed by Marti, that the land and the resources of the country belong to the people as a whole, that mass education, culture and public health were free things to be shared amongst all, and that this could be achieved uh, and had to be achieved through the integration of the peoples of the Americas. So as Marti said, that the 
the forest, the trees have to form ranks, files, so that the giant with the seven league loops can't walk between them. Marti was talking about what many other Latin American pioneers of independence said was that the small countries could not resist the big powers by themselves, but had to come together and form an alliance to carry out that sort of resistance. Within Cuban revolutionary culture for the last six decades, we've had other important ideas, which I'll just touch on here because we'll deal with it on another in another session. But um, the idea of everyday heroism in Cuban revolutionary culture, that people had a role to play. Uh, in some ways, it parallels the steadfastness idea in Palestine, for example, of people in their individual life carrying out this sort of resistance. And here we have the president of Cuba's National Assembly commending the Cuban doctors in their internationalist missions who had gone out through 2020, for example, providing assistance to various countries around the world, more than two dozen countries. And on the occasion of the Day of Latin American Medicine, uh, Esteban Lazo sent a congratulations to and recognition of those doctors for their deeply humane and courageous performance on the front line in the confrontation with the COVID-19 pandemic. The pages of everyday heroism, he says, that you write in our country and other nations of the world are a concrete expression of the social transformations in Cuba, where the health of the people was one of the essential aspects of the 1957 Moncada program. And after that, the triumph of the revolution, it became a solid system that guarantees health as a fundamental human right. A collectivist idea, something that draws on long traditions, but something we can see reflected in other cultures of social commitment and self-sacrifice in other parts of the world too. Going back to the, the Lebanese resistance, I return to the theme that there is this type of universal language, you could even say a secular language, even though the inspiration for the party, Hezbollah, the party of God, is clearly a religious one. Now, the Vice President, Naim Qasem, said some years ago that liberation of the land is practical evidence demonstrated by the resistance. Israel, the Zionist entity as it's called in Lebanon, was without a doubt expelled from our country. He's talking about the liberation wars leading up to 2000 and the defeat of the Israeli invasion in 2006. Um, they were expelled from our country. Our land was returned with honor and dignity. Resistance is a reaction to occupation, aggression and injustice. It has proven its feasibility and is built on the concept of strength, sovereign, sovereignty and liberation. Uh, the General Secretary, Hassan Nasrallah, said after the, the victory of 2006 that the resistance, he's talking about the Lebanese resistance here, is the result of it was created by the occupation, he means the Israeli occupation, the continued detention of captives, the robbery of our waters, the repeated breaches and attacks on Lebanese sovereignty, and the way forward is through building a just, strong, resistance, clean and honourable state. You will see that in the context of a country like Lebanon, which is inherently pluralistic, that is to say it has many different communities, religious communities, um, Nasrallah and Naim Qasem are using this language which is more universal than just a call to their particular religion. Here's a commentator um, some years ago who was talking about the, the secular adaptation of Lebanon's resistance. Um, Daga said that Hezbollah members and sympathizers began active efforts to encourage Christian support for its resistance role immediately after the leader's decision to enter the 1920 and 1992 elections. That was after the, the Taif Accords, where there was a, a type of a, a healing process after the long civil war. And that, he said, followed Syed Fadlallah's lead, who was a Shia leader who was not really exactly uh, integrated into the Hezbollah ideology. Uh, and there were some important points of difference, but nevertheless a, a respectful relationship. In 1999, Hezbollah formed a coalition with the Communist Party and various leftist currents. Hezbollah is far from being fixated on unrealistic all or nothing objectives, even though their language is that of a, uh, a Islamic language and Islamic inspiration. Hezbollah faces a permanent military and political pressure, terrorist labeling, that is to say vilification from outside, from Israel and from the US, from Britain and France. But its political program remains an essentially secular one, that is to say supporting Lebanese national sovereignty and one that will closely correspond to the agenda of leftist and national political forces. It will remain essentially an essentially Islamist party on the intellectual level, but will most likely become a semi-secularized one on the national political level. And we can, of course, see that 
uh, in many respects, including the strong relationship between Hezbollah and the Syrian uh, army, which has been fighting Western-backed Islamist terrorism, and Syria itself being a state that is trying to minimise the organised religious content in the state to allow for the historic pluralism that is inherently a part of Syria. So resistance, uh, looking at those two different experiences, does recognise shared values, and we can see it in day-to-day -day life with crowds carrying pictures of Chavez and Nasrallah in Lebanon when Chavez made some de decisive statements, decisive moves and visited the region. Uh, Nasrallah said in 2009 that Chavez, the Venezuelan leader, expelled the Israeli ambassador in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Chavez has done that out of his great sense of humanity and his revolutionary spirit. Some Arab rulers should learn about solidarity with the people of Palestine from a leader in Latin America. He's referring to most likely the Arab leaders in the Gulf, the Persian Gulf monarchies. Here we have another poster, bottom right there, a popular recognition of the um, the combined, uh, or let's say common values of Chavez, of Nasrallah, and of the great Egyptian nationalist Nasser, um, who was neither uh, a religious leader, but an Arab nationalist leader, more aligned to the type of system that exists in uh, Syria today. Now we also see very practical measures for cooperation between resistance nations, that is to say Iran and Cuba, and Cuba and Syria teaming up in areas of COVID vaccine and other types of vaccines and medical support. There's a great deal of cooperation going on at that level. And you may have seen also that the cooperation between Venezuela and Iran, where when Iran's oil refineries were effectively shut down by the economic blockade, which was preventing parts getting there, Iran was sending tankers of support to Venezuela as Venezuela had helped Iran many years earlier. So there is already a fair degree of cooperation between these uh, resistance cultures. Let's go a little bit to the south of Lebanon now to look at Palestine, because in Palestine there is this very popular concept of Samud in Arabic, which means steadfastness really, but its meaning has changed over the years. Now, a very good article written a few years ago called uh, To Exist is to Resist, Samud Heroism and the Everyday, published in the Jerusalem Quarterly, pointed out that Sumud or steadfastness was part of a collective Palestinian consciousness of struggling for and clinging to the land that goes back at least to the British Mandate time, but it became popular in the 1960s, in particular during and after the War of 1967, where the, the issue became whether people would be driven off their lands as they had been in 1948, or whether they would remain on their lands under occupation. Then, uh, the, these authors point out that Sumud turned into a concept of intellectual debate amongst Palestinian scholars about strategic development, and it became associated with inflated rhetoric, political agendas, and corruption. And so a sort of a distinction was created between active or, or passive Sumud uh, and resistance, or Sumud emphasizing nonviolence or small contributions, and so on. Um, so that debate also, to some extent, was associated with the ideas of a third way, but also ideas of corruption and corruption amongst the bureaucracies. But uh, more recently, uh, there's been some sort of synthesis of the ideas saying that Sumud should be regarded as a, or let's say Palestinians see it, as entailing various direct forms of resistance, such as including demonstrations, including other forms of active resistance, but also the, no the notion of remaining on the land, the personal responsibility to remain, to build and maintain social relationships. So that's an important concept which we can see mirrored in other cultures too. In particular, this one. If we look at customary landowner resistance in Melanesia, in the countries in the south west Pacific of Papua New Guinea, of Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands, and some other states, we have this uh, really in many respects state and non-state uh, resistance movement, which is to defend clan-owned and managed land. That is to say, in Melanesia, Melanesia was relatively undisturbed. The land tenure was undisturbed by either feudalism or the colonial era. At the end of the colonial era, in the 1970s, most of the people of those countries maintained uh, owner, owners of their own land under their clan system in their village areas. 
in Papua New Guinea more than 85%, for example. But there, since the independence, there has been a continued pressure from uh, large corporations backed by international finance institutions to try and grab that land and to displace the customary landowners who are effectively asset rich but cash poor and very subject to pressures. So the defenders of customary land, the resistance in this case, are saying that these people should stay on their land because they have better futures by staying on their land and that cash economy shouldn't displace many of those traditional activities. So hybrid livelihoods, I've written about this saying using land, small business and employment are key to maintaining traditional values in modern Melanesian societies. Um, let's look at, before we go to a, a commentary by Vanuatu politician, Ralph Regan Vanu, a video by Aipapu Marai, a Papua New Guinea man in the, the highlands or the, the midlands, let's say in Medan, about his experience and his perspective on the need to maintain control of community, customary owned land, community land in Papua New Guinea. That's a one blood white man and one blood man in Australia and work on them a global company and by one blood company blow oil pump by coming down, now it's tap and tap, ramu sugar. By sending you to oil palm, na pour que si ground pour you, na pour pinsim ground pour you. Oil planim, oil palm, platim this pour all the ground. Ina pour all pour mountain, you go ina pour ramu. Na you pay, you go into pour mountain, you na view stop put lo ya. How pour me can stop him this oil palm? Man, white man, he been talking me more than something. Or sim na mi kirap kisim nine pla nine pla all what inside lo usin na lechi na mi pla walking one pla association na name pla this association nam Ramu Valley Renault Association this pla ground mas ikat or something by swim government. Swing company or some crown for me, you can make use. Now you can make him he come up. So, I Papu Marai is talking about a Papua New Guinea experience and one that ended up being rather successful that is to say, resistance at a village level to demonstrate to an unsympathetic government that they were able to manage and make use of their land and they didn't want to surrender their land to a large corporation um, which would had its own business dealings with the government. Now, the situation in Vanuatu is rather similar, but here we have a voice at a national level, uh, Ralph Regan Vano, who's been a minister in, in various governments there, someone with a strong background in the defence of customary land. And Ralph, uh, there's a quote here, which I'll let you read from the notes there, but essentially he's talking about the importance of maintaining the traditional values of customary law and customary communities and customary land ownership while the cash economy is still there and therefore a need to have some sort of balance between them and to put in safeguards to prevent the growth of the cash economy from negatively impacting the traditional economy. If we look at a number of informal markets, for example, they're typically undervalued. At the bottom right there, I've got a picture from a watermelon roadside market in Medang in Upper Ramu where watermelons sell for one day's wages, for example. So you can see people growing basically fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, essential staples of life, uh, can make quite a good living out of that. And that's not counted very well in modern economies. Um, and it doesn't preclude other types of economic activities there. So there we have a, for a form of resistance, which is quite different, but in a sense, it shares some of those same features of confronting and opposing, organizing in the face of predatory outside interests that want to steal land not too different from what was going on in Cuba and Lebanon in that sense. Let's move on to the current challenges for self-determination. I mentioned at the beginning that there are some of these new phenomenon of doublespeak in particular in the current era because 
colonialism is no longer acceptable or legitimate in terms of international norms. And so we have new forms of ideas or the colonization of ideas to try and uh, encourage people to surrender to inevitable projects of globalization and so on. That's why globalism has been spoken of as a type of globalization of corporate elites. And economic development also has become a concept with double meanings. And even the, the concept of hegemony, which was originally created by radical thinkers like Antonio Gramsci, the Italian communist, uh, nevertheless, that's been co-opted into new uh, forms of double speak these days. Let's not ignore the neoliberal Washington Washington consensus, that is to say, where everyone in Washington agrees with what the rest of the world needs, which is which has been basically a an economic program for the last 40 years or so to try and impose economic mandates on other countries. It raises the question as whether invasions such as those of Afghanistan and Iraq earlier this century are a thing of the past. That indeed was being argued by the writers Hart and Negri in their book Empire in the year 2000, where they said there were new forms of empire and new forms of oligarchies and new forms of war and domination. But of course, unfortunately for them, even though the book was popular, the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq followed uh, very quickly on the heels of that book. Of course, invasions, military invasions require a strong state, a strong leading state. And so essentially the USA put the notion of imperialism led by a strong state back in center stage and away from the idea of some broader, uh, vague cultural or oligarchical domination. Nevertheless, we still have that form of oligarchy and that form of ideological domination. Indeed, the planners in Washington speak about fourth generation war or what I call hybrid war, that is to say ideological, economic and proxy wars. Um, the liberal side of US politics talks about smart power. There are Pentagon doctrines of the 21st century, which include the concepts full spectrum dominance, that is to say the US military is now committed not just to military dominance, but economic and ideological dominance, cultural dominance. There's a concept called destroying disconnectedness, which says that countries that are outside the globalism created by global elites have to be reincorporated by force if necessary. And we have some of these new newer concepts such as a responsibility to protect, which draws on an older colonial concept of humanitarian intervention. So just briefly, I'll go through these and I've left the, the references there and you can see them and follow them up in the, um, in the notes. The Washington Consensus dating from experiments in the 1970s, but really consolidated forms in the early 1980s led by the IMF and the World Bank were the idea of particularly by using the, the international debt crisis of the early 80s to enforce ideas of open markets and privatizations that they meant open markets to allow the entry of large multinational corporations into other countries to stress private property rights and intellectual property rights, IPRs, to run an ideology of liberal freedoms really selectively in favor of large corporations within hegemonic themes. And by hegemonic themes, I mean ideas that are conducive to those select, the selective application of those economic ideas. Then at the Pentagon level, we have this notion of fourth generation war, which is really about incorporating non-state opponents or proxy armies um, such as the Contra Wars in Latin America in the 80s or the Contra Wars, um, the, the jihadists conscripted for the dirty wars in Iraq and Syria and, and Libya in the, 19, in, the two, in the 21st century and the ideological elements, which William Lynn talks about as the point uh, includes the poisonous ideology of multiculturalism. So conservatives in the US have their own view that this fourth generation war is something being waged against them and not something that they are waging. It's something they have to address at all those sorts of levels. And Thomas Barnett is the person most associated with this idea of destroying disconnectedness. Hegemony and development, these concepts need a little explanation because they have been used in different ways. Hegemony, for example, has been used in both the neo-Marxist and the neo-realist or uh, more reactionary traditions, um, just as imperialism and uh, uh, used, sorry, used in the concepts of imperialism by Gramsci and Kiernan. Gramsci, for example, spoke about 
uh, ideological hegemony uh, over the middle classes, the middle class would adopt ruling class ideas in Europe, for example, as part of imperial strategy. But then in the US in the 1970s, we have this idea of hegemonic stability, uh, stabilizing uh, process where a hegemon or a dominant power was necessary to stabilize and contain the world for the benefits of free trade and so on. So hegemony, just to say, is used in uh, in different senses, and we have to understand that. Development also is used in different ways. It's used in a modernistic way um, to talk about development along the lines that large corporations want, sim simplified to economic growth, and therefore large foreign investments are the quickest way to demonstrate some of it, form of economic growth, even if populations don't get the benefits there. But it's also been used by some of the, the critics of neoliberalism to talk about advances in economic capacity. Um, Dennis Goulet has written about independent development in the service of, of people controlling their own destiny, for example. Amartya Sen, who used liberal ideas to talk about the advance of uh, building human capacity in societies rather than talking about economic growth. But there's another critical tradition which talks about development as a colonial concept itself as entrapment in what people such as Andre Gunder Frank have, have called underdevelopment. And Frank was emphasizing the idea that development for a rich, rich country necessarily had a flip side, which was underdevelopment for a country which was being exploited. Well, now Herianto in Indonesia and Veltemeyer have also spoken about this notion of development as a neo-colonial neo concept. And in fact, a dirty word in many contexts, really. But to put it in its more optimistic form from Goulet and Tandon, for example, development might still mean a people's successful assumption of control over their own destiny, a form of liberation. If that was the case, um, successful economic advances, let's say, in, 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 in the interests of the people as a whole, means escape from a form of neocolonialism. It means a form of, of liberation. So we have to understand that there are different languages, economic languages, and they both borrow or seek to control um, the perceived benefits of these sorts of terms. Here's Andre Gunder Frank, who is talking about development and undevelopment, one of the leaders of that so-called dependency school in Latin America, which spoke of the failures of industrialization, the failures of advancing capacity in Latin American countries because of the domination by the big metropolis of London's and the New York's of the world, and leaving little Latin American countries with no real role just to export uh, produce, primary produce, for example, but then that came under attack in the 1980s with the rise of the so-called East Asian tigers, the industrialization of many parts of East Asia. Now, another challenge, humanitarian intervention, which, as I mentioned, had a longer history in uh, European liberalism, for example, and the North American writer Gary Bass refers to that specifically, he talks about humanitarian intervention by the British Empire against slavery in one case and by the US against the Spanish. For some reason, that was meant to be a humanitarian intervention, the US intervening against Spain in the wars of independence in the Philippines and in Cuba, for example. And Bass quotes John Stuart Mill, one of the most famous British liberals, who was uh, an opponent of slavery and absolute sovereignty of kings and so on, but an advocate of intervention by the imperial powers because he believed in the inherent superiority of the British Empire. John Stuart Mill wrote, for example, and we could see parallels in some of the language by the British and the North Americans when they carried out their invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, for example, that barbarians have no rights as a nation except the right to such treatment to fit them for becoming one. We should mediate in the quarrels which break out between foreign states and so on. In other words, to impose the values of British civilization and to help abolish the slave trade and to abolish the, the practice of widow mooning on the pyres in India and so on. So all of the high sounding rationales for colonial occupation. Now, more recently, certainly in the 21st century, this idea of humanitarian intervention became very much a US liberal project. And so when we look at the White Paper commissioned by Bill Clinton in 2000, there was three options. And the most aggressive one really came from 
uh, a director of a group called Human Rights Watch, which is a, a US NGO created in the late 70s, essentially to demonize the Soviet Union under a concept called the Helsinki Project. But Human Rights Watch, while pretending to be an independent body, is really very much part of the the foreign policy elite, more aligned to the Democrat Party in the US. Now, in that project, um, the Human Rights Watch director at the time, Holly Burkhalter, was talking about the need for greater intervention to suppress what they call great crimes, so-called genocide and crimes against humanity, which indeed, if we look historically, were far more a product of imperialism and imperial intervention than by any form of resistance. Now, even the military, um, and intelligence communities in the US were more cautious about those sorts of interventions. But nevertheless, we do see to this day that intervention with those sort of humanitarian pretexts were really driven by the liberal side of US politics, in particular with the Hillary Clintons and the, the, the Barack Obamas of the world and their wars in Libya, in Syria, and the, um, the inflation of this uh, the Al-Qaeda groups and particularly the creation of the group called Daesh or ISIS in Iraq and then in Syria. The use of those forces as proxy armies to try and get their way with independent states in the region. So the result of that is the big powers uh, and their allies, have they've, they've brought them along with them, have commissioned this new doctrine called a responsibility to protect. A new Western doctrine, really, it was nothing demanded by the developing countries or the non-aligned movement, for example. It's seen precisely as a new imperial doctrine there. But there was an international commission on intervention and state sovereignty using Cambodia and Rwanda as pretext to promoting sovereignty as responsibility. In other words, sovereignty was only a relative concept. And if the big powers saw there was some benevolent purpose in intervening, they would do it. Now, there was a summit in 2005, um, a world summit following up on the Millennium Summit, which included a paragraph which reinforced international law. It didn't change international law, but it said that each individual state has a responsibility to protect its populations from the various great crimes, but that the international community should encourage and help states exercise that responsibility and that the international community through the United Nations has a responsibility to use appropriate diplomatic, humanitarian and other peaceful means and according with chapters six and eight of the Charter, but through the Security Council in accordance with the Charter, including chapter seven, that's the, the pretext for armed intervention on a case by case basis. So there was no real change in international law here, but there was an emphasis on perhaps the Security Council using Chapter 7 for armed intervention. Indeed, this was used in the case of Libya in 2011, and this is, helps explain the rationale, the justification for the NATO bombing and destruction of the Libyan state, the state with the, the highest living standards in Africa, with an extremely high status of women. All of that was wiped out very quickly with that intervention, and it was a a really very important test case, uh, an important discrediting test case for the use of uh, this responsibility to protect doctrine. Now I want to move on to forms of resistance um, under these headings, human development in the post-colonial state, resource sovereignty, Iran's resistance economy, colonization, ethnic cleansing and the right to resist and resistance and terrorism, the difference between them. Now, resistance exists in popular movements, as I pointed out, with the, the defense of customary land ownership in Melanesia, but it's usually led by independent states and the large conflicts that we see in Latin America, in the Middle East in particular, also in Africa, are particularly, generally speaking, uh, conflicts between independent states and the, the big powers. But what type of post-colonial state? Now, the hegemonic power in part making use of liberal ideology demands weak subordinate states. There are all these rationales with liberalism and neoliberalism. The state should be subordinate to markets and so on, with the exception of the big power, with the exception of the hegemonic stabilizing power. So there's a contradiction there. But nevertheless, it's the case that any independent state is immediately attacked as dictatorial and so on and so on, repressing freedoms and so on. This is part of the idea of the big power, the imperial powers, who have masses of nuclear weapons and other forms of weapons and arm their reliable subordinates with, with their weapons industries, 
but they demand that all states be kept weak. And many, unfortunately, many Western people join in this chorus because they have a sense that dictatorial states is something that's inherently evil and that a strong state to resist the powers of big states is something that they can't really conceive of. So to claim that the state is an obstacle to individual and market freedoms that's backed by the economic doctrine of the IMF and the World Bank, uh, even in many leftist, Western leftist views, there is the idea that the state is largely captured by do dominant sections of capital of large corporations, which is indeed the case in Europe, in, in North America, for example. But on the other hand, independent development, we can see from a number of important examples, requires a strong rights enabling state. It's not possible to run an independent uh, economic policy and foreign policy without also defending it against enormous pressures that come from the big powers. Now, human development ideas are very important, but they don't prescribe the means. Indeed, the idea of increased human capability uh, discussed by people like Amartya Sen, a very val valuable contribution, uh, nevertheless, it's been criticized as being individualized and undefined. It doesn't really say how those human capabilities are to be uh, defined, let alone created. So how does human development occur? And most of the big debates we come across and we'll talk about in this course are precisely about the means. How do states enable uh, the development of human capacity? How is food security brought about? How is the right to education or the right to health brought about? These are really a lot to do with the means rather than the, the ends of it. Now, resource sovereignty is at the center of these independent struggles and there's a very good uh, speech which I recorded by the late Hugo Chavez in Venezuela back in 2006, where he was talking about some common history in Latin America, but particularly the history of uh, Venezuela in face of the economic domination, what's called neocolonialism, or the, uh, stressing the need for a second independence in Latin America. That is to say, Venezuela and the other countries may have been politically independent, but they were economically dependent on the big powers that ran their oil industries and the oil conglomerates were linked into a corrupt network which would really sap the, the, the benefits of those natural resources from the country. So let's listen to the late Hugo Chavez. One of the convenios that we have signed and we are ready to start to is that all the combustible that Bolivia is importing, because this is one of the great bueno, de, la, de las realidades de nuestras coloniales economías. Bolivia, que tiene tanta energía, tiene que importar combustible. Igual le pasa al Ecuador blanco. Ecuador exporta petróleo crudo e importa combustible. Vaya usted a ver. El colonialismo. Por eso hay que insistir. Lo que en América Latina se ha iniciado de nuevo es el mismo proceso que quedó pendiente de Bolívar, de San Martín, de O'Higgins, de Artigas, la independencia. Y Venezuela tiene la primera reserva de petróleo que país alguno tenga en el mundo. Esa es la razón fundamental del desespero de Mr. Danger. Ellos quieren el petróleo venezolano y el gas venezolano. Lo tuvieron durante 100 años, lo hemos recuperado y ahora ese petróleo es para el desarrollo de nuestro pueblo y para el desarrollo de los pueblos más pobres de este continente. Venezuela no más nunca será colonia de los Estados Unidos de Norteamérica. So Chavez was talking about something which rang true across a range of Latin American countries. Let's go back to the Middle East and what the Islamic Republic of Iran calls its resistance economy in recent times. And that is an idea that is about how to grow an economy, an economic system under the pressure, under the so-called sanctions or the unilateral coercive measures of the big power, the economic war that's being waged against them. Is it possible in these sorts of circumstances for a country, even a big country like Iran, to thrive and to, and to move forward? 
Well, in the idea of the leader, the idea of Iran's resistance economy was to provide for growth and prosperity, even under pressure, with the idea of turning vulnerability into opportunities. So in the first instance, that was about boosting domestic production or substituting local product for imports. But it also meant to build local industries which could become export industries. So, for example, in recent years, Iran had moved from being an importer of steel to an exporter of steel. Um, so it successfully grew its steel industry there. It includes the idea of securitization. That is, there is a military role in the organization of production and exchange. There is, in other words, a greater level of organization, if you like, of hierarchical organization. And so, of course, the, the imperial opponents call them dictatorships and so on. Nevertheless, the idea that the industry is also a matter of security and therefore that the armed forces have to be involved in looking for attempts to sabotage, looking for ways in which they can avoid the type of economic blockade um, pursued under the, the pseudonym of sanctions, which suggests some sort of judicial approach. There's also the challenge of greater participation and improved management. So in Iran, there was recognition. There were a lot of serious local problems of corruption and the need to enhance participation at the elite level and the technological level and the cooperative and the popular level. So that involved a mixture of state planning, addressing corruption, and also, of course, the question of stabilizing the currency, which is one of the more difficult things, particularly in small countries. Then there is also the question of the strategic partners and Iran's regional role. So there are a number of partners that Iran has, not least Russia and China these days, but also some of the local states that are important for major investments. And the state is involved in that sort of regional stabilization process. Here's another challenge for resistance. Uh, we have this ongoing ethnic cleansing in Israel, which is a continuation of what was called Plan D or Plan Dalit in 1948, um, under the supervision of the Zionist leader Ben Gurion at that time. The idea was to destroy villages by burning them, by blowing them up, by planting mines, to wipe out uh, resistance, to expel the population involved in those resistance areas outside the borders of the state, a classical ethnic cleansing process, which has been documented by the, the, the great uh, Israeli historian Ilan Pape. And here's some references to that. Now, in the circumstances of that ethnic cleansing carrying on over more than seven decades, we have recognition of the right of colonized people, of people under ethnic cleansing to armed um, struggle, to active resistance against colonization and against apartheid. So there are UN resolutions in 1974, in 1978, in 1982, specifically dealing with the Palestinian people, with the Namibian people, with the South African people, uh, emphasize that in the post-colonial era, in the late 20th century, there was this increased international recognition of the right to armed resistance against colonization and apartheid in particular. Which raises the question of what's the difference between resistance and terrorism? And that is a label. Terrorism is a label given to uh, a, a real phenomenon, but given to resistance movements in many cases. For example, Palestinian resistance movements, Lebanese resistance, the anti-apartheid forces in apartheid South Africa were called terrorist groups or are still called terrorist groups with the aim of trying to delegitimize that uh, anti-colonial, anti-apartheid movement. In the case of resistance or in the case of armed resistance, the aim is to expel a colonizing force or an apartheid regime. With terrorism, it's about destabilizing a civilian population that's usually backed by foreign powers or adventurists without popular support. In the case of resistance, uh, the rep it represents the legitimate interests of Indigenous people and uses disciplined and proportionate use of force because, of course, people in a, con in a constrained area are going to sub be subject to the consequences of their actions. In the case of terrorism, in most cases, it's anonymous groups act in the interests of a foreign power and the methods are to attack soft targets to destabilise legitimate states. And some of the examples of that are the US-Saudi-Turkey-backed ISIS group or Daesh and Jabhat al-Nusra, the Al-Qaeda group in Syria, 
and the US-backed death squads in Central America. So there are some quite clear differences between resistance and terrorism, but of course it's in the interest of the big power to try and blur that difference and to try and brand all anti-colonial, anti-apartheid struggles as terrorist in some way. Finally, we come to the media wars. Given that ideological struggle is so important in the current day, we have these new challenges in social media monopolies, the Facebooks and the Twitters and YouTubes, which are enforcing their own rules, uh, typically against resistance forces. We have new forms of vexatious propaganda, more sophisticated propaganda um, waged against the resistance forces. We have innovations in resistance media, and we have this uh, longer standing phenomenon of embedded NGOs or hired media activists, a very large uh, proliferation of so-called NGOs, which are in fact hired by the big powers for their particular purposes. Now, in the case of social media, we know that in the current era, particularly recently, there's been a wide scale censoring of posts supporting resistance figures. For example, after the US under President Trump murdered the great Iraqi and Iranian resistance heroes, uh, Abu al-Mahandas, uh, Abu Mahdi al-Mohandas and General Qasem Soleimani uh, and there was an outpouring of posts in sympathy with uh, those two and Facebook admitted censoring those and shutting down or suspending the accounts of many people who were supporting them saying they were dangerous people they were people who were murdered very obviously assassinated by President Donald Trump um, under the pretext of opposing US operations in the Middle East and then they themselves became a pretext for haunting the social media and the social media became, or they say the US-based social media became very much embedded with the ideological plans of the US state. In the case of humanitarian intervention, I, meant, I mentioned there's a great deal of popular and academic uh, prolifera, uh, uh, let's say, um, advertising, you know, um, evangelizing of this idea of responsibility to protect in countries like Libya and Syria, the, the false idea that there was, for example, a civil war in Syria, which is occupied by two NATO powers, Turkey and the US and Israel, uh, occupied by three foreign armies who have effectively admitted to sponsoring all of the terrorist groups in Syria for the last decade. Nevertheless, you would find Wikipedia, for example, which largely reflects the Western media, still talking about a civil war. And there, at the level of the institutions themselves, there are um, battles between those companies like this attempt by um, groups to take down Telegram, which was originally a Russian alternative to WhatsApp and so on. So. In the areas of war and but also corporate privilege and privatization, we have this ongoing campaigns to promote the same ideas of the old media monopolies, but through these new means by which people have some form of participation. Well, that brings me to this next point about vexatious propaganda. It's a concept that I'm developing to talk about the stories that are created to distract more than to convince, that is to say, to, to argue that uh, all of the aggression against Iran was because Iran was about to produce or was producing nuclear weapons. There's never been any, any evidence of that at all. The same with the weapons of mass destruction against Iraq. It was entirely false, as was proven, as was admitted later on after Iraq had been destroyed in many respects. The arguments about the use of chemical weapons in Syria in the same camp really discredited by the evidence from um, the perpetrators themselves, the British military, the US military had many times, independent experts in the US had cast doubt on these claims. Nevertheless, the claims keep being made. They are supported by hired helpers, so-called media activists and so on, and therefore they distract attention. People keep talking about it. It reminds me of something said by the media analyst Marshall McLuhan back in the 1960s. I think his book was called The, the Medium is the Mass, The Massage is the Medium. Um, he said that it's not really that, that that media is telling us what to think. They are telling us what to think about. So if people keep talking about Iran's non-existent nuclear weapon or Syria's non-existent chemical attacks or Iraq's non-existent WMDs, which are a threat to Britain and the US directly, uh, then of course they won't be able to engage with the actual realities. So I say 
the aim of this vexatious propaganda is to block reasonable discussion and have immediate spread effects, that is to try and monopolise and distract attention in particular areas or over particular matters. That media might tolerate some criticism, but not complete disregard of their stories. But they aim to intimidate independent public debate, which seeks to disregard propaganda and move on to real histories, for example. So I mentioned some examples of that already, the idea that Israel is a democracy and not only that, the only democracy in its region um, and ignoring the fact that it's a demonstrable apartheid state, that harsh criticism of Israel is anti-Jewish racism, uh, that the unelected Washington puppet Juan Guaido is the real president of Venezuela. These are absurd things, but under the ambit, under the umbrella of the, that sort of vexatious propaganda, other sorts of real crimes are carried out. Britain and the US steal the assets of Venezuela using a false pretext that the real president is not the real president, for example. The whole Citgo chain in the US, a multi-billion dollar fuel industry operative is stolen uh, because of this false pretext that no one in their right mind had believed this, this unelected Washington uh, funded person is the real president of Venezuela. We can test myths with independent evidence. Here's one example, uh, the, the argument that the US military and their, their associated drug enforcement agency has been repressing drug production in Colombia and Afghanistan. And that's one of the reasons why they're there. We can go to the UN's agency on, on drugs and see that indeed US occupied Afghanistan is the record producer of world opium. 84% that US occupied Colombia with, I think, seven US military bases produces 70% of the world's cocaine production. So sometimes it is possible to get independent evidence, and this is important for researchers to contest these sorts of claims. But nevertheless, the argument that the US Drug Enforcement Agency is involved in some sort of war against drugs is one of these elements of vexatious propaganda. There are important resistance collaborations. Uh, this is important for independent and genuine voices in today's ideological wars. One of the most prominent is Telesur, created uh, by late Hugo Chavez in Venezuela as a counterweight to the US-run CNN in Spanish to show our reality. And it's been a very successful Spanish language regional news outlet with collaboration from many states in Latin America, but with its bases in Caracas and in Quito, Ecuador, um, and, but nevertheless, programs from Colombia, from Argentina, from many other parts of Latin America there. Um, there are also collaborations between the Latin American and some of the Middle Eastern media. And the most, uh, the most prominent in the Middle East has been Iran, because Iran has a very large, the, the largest independent media in the Middle East, and also uh, in many, many languages, including English, uh, but also including Spanish. So we have Hispan TV from Iran, and we have Al Maidin in Spanish, which is a Lebanese-based channel, which has a collaboration with Telesur. So that those collaborations, uh, let's say South-South uh, cooperations, um, along with the countervailing media from bigger powers like Iran, China, and Russia, are extremely important in today's media wars. Um, the embedded NGOs, that is to say, NGOs, supposed non-government organizations that are really set up by states to pursue their propaganda. This has a longer history going back to Freedom House, set up by USAID in the US in the 1940s during the Second World War to campaign against so-called denials of freedom and its strategic enemies um, ever since then. The National Endowment for Democracy, which was set up in the early 80s under the Reagan administration, a private non-profit organization, but nevertheless took over many of the functions that the CIA was carrying beyond that. And since then, we've had a number of other uh, particularly US-based organisations, but also some uh, funded by um, the UK and by France. Uh, Reporters Without Borders, uh, set up in France, but partly funded by the USAID with links to French intelligence and funded by the US government. Human Rights Watch, uh, an element of US foreign policy elite, which has been promoting this idea of humanitarian intervention, but has been criticized by many of us for having a revolving door policy with the US State Department. Amnesty International in the US is also in the same sort of category. There are people going backwards and forwards between Amnesty US and the US State Department, as with Human Rights Watch there. Now, in recent 
years with the wars in the Middle East, the new Middle East wars, there have been a large number, dozens and dozens of NGOs funded to try and influence public opinion, to try and diffuse criticism of the half a dozen wars going on in the Middle East for attempted control of the Middle East. And many millions of dollars have been invested in creating those sorts of bodies. So here's an overview of some of the resistance systems that I've been speaking about, both state and non-state. And I've set it up in several categories, inspiration and strategic adaptation. And I do this for a reason to say that in some cases, as with Iran and Hezbollah, where there is a religious inspiration, which is coherent, a very strong unifying force. Nevertheless, there are necessary strategic adaptations because there are alliances well beyond the boundaries of those um, religious traditions. In Cuba, secular humanism, socialism, similarly engage strategically with a diverse group of regional and international partners. That is to say the indigenous philosophy in the, um, the projects in uh, Bolivia and un when Rafael Correa was a president in Ecuador, taking on a number of indigenous concepts, synthesizing them into their mix. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, Nicaragua, a number of different progressive Latin American countries were able to share diverse systems because they uh, shared some common principles. In Melanesia, we have a customary landowner resistance, which is about inclusive customary land systems, um, which is trying to maintain the value of traditional systems while adapting to contemporary economy, resisting land theft and maintaining clan ownership, um, which includes outsiders if they support and participate those sorts of systems. There are unique features of all of these resistance systems. Um, their key values overlap in some respects. They do share some common values, which I'll leave a little bit open for people to interpret. They have some common enemies, certainly thematically, and they've made some innovations. In the case of Iran, we have this idea of resistance economy, a regional axis coalition. With Hezbollah, we have this cross community as well as a regional resistance alliance to um, fight against the uh, the new wars of the 21st century in the Middle East. With Cuba, we have this extraordinary mass doctor training, huge scholarship programs for poor countries, medical internationalism, which has carried on throughout the, the COVID epidemic in 2020 and 2021. And in Melanesia, we have this innovation of productive hybrid livelihoods where there is a mixture of um, traditional land economic activities with modern economic activities. So to sum up, resistance cultures do cross different cultures. Um, they include um, diverse um, value systems in different cultures. They've existed for a very long time, but we could define them as or resistance as collective action aimed at realizing the right of a people to self-determination. That resistance exists in many different cultures, but may face common threats, um, struggling against foreign domination, intervention and dispossession. Resistance itself requires strong social structures to defend and reproduce those independent cultures and social systems. They are typically solidarity societies. They assert and preserve unique cultural values, but they also share many common values, such as mutual respect, a, an advanced social conscience, sharing systems and the concept of self-sacrifice for the community. They advance human capacity through their independent structures, but they need alliances to better defend and build their achievements.